Uh, first, I want to waste some of my scarce seconds to thank the organizers um, for this meeting. Um, second, I have an apology. I'm not talking, as announced, about uh, quantum gravity phenomenology. Uh, the reason is that I figured the field has grown so much um, that it's impossible to sensibly summarize it in eight minutes. And the other reason is that Fortini still convinced me that quantum gravity phenomenology is now a completely established topic and it's not really weird enough to talk about here. <laughs> so, um, instead I want to talk about something really repulsive. I want to talk about it. <laughs> so just so you know what I'm talking about, I mean stuff falling up. So uh, anti-gravitation. Um, yeah, I guess it, you haven't seen very many things falling up, so um, a brief um, motivation for this is, um, well, so that's the really, really brief motivation. Uh, we know there's something missing in our understanding of the universe, so just um, to give you some key words uh, would be singularity avoidance, the structure of voids, so we know there are some shortcomings within the CDM, the cosmological constant, and so on and so forth. So this is an extension of um, classical general relativity that I hope might be useful to address some of these, though I don't know this yet. So, okay. Um, Use the arrow. Which is the magic button? Use the arrow, please. Um, okay, cool. So, um, to get out of the way some common misunderstandings uh, with anti-gravitation. Um, if you look at Feynman's lectures on gravity, you will find that he talks about anti-gravitation. So what he means with anti-gravitation is um, a repulsive interaction between particles and their anti-particles. That's not what I'm talking about. Um, I have a completely second sector of the standard model that's identical to the standard model except for the gravitational interaction. So um, among themselves, each sector of these particles has an attractive gravitational interaction, but they repel each other. So um, what you find indeed is if um, you look at the interaction term and the effective action between a particle and an antiparticle, um, it's attractive, but it's proportional to the currents. Um, so the currents in this case are the stress energy tensor and um, obviously usually they are both positive um, but if you can sh switch the sign of one then it becomes repulsive um, so um, even though this is the section of quantum gravity um, this talk is unconscious so it's a completely classical uh, model that I'm talking about so these sorts of particles that I'm talking about they only interact gravitationally so it's a very very weak uh, interaction in particular that that second sector of the standard model is dark because um, it doesn't have anything that we could um, detect other than uh, gravitationally. So um, the purpose of the talk is um, to tell you that it is possible to extend um, GR in such a way that it allows for negative gravitational charges if you do it carefully. So um, in the eight minutes, I probably won't manage to really convince you of that but um, I'll roughly tell you how it works. So, um, okay, so, um, um, well, if you think about Newtonian gravity, you think, <laughs> If you think about Newtonian gravity, then you think it's not so complicated to get um, a repulsive interaction. You just take your potential and you switch one of the masses and there, well, it's repulsive. Uh, but if you think about general relativity, um, you notice that it's not so um, easy because the geodesic equation doesn't depend on the mass of the particle. So whatever you do, the thing will fall down on Earth. Um, so what you have to realize is that the covariant derivative that you use is not um, uniquely defined. It's only uniquely defined after you specify it to be metric compatible and torsion free. So um, I don't want to bother with torsion mostly because it doesn't enter the geodesic equation anyway. So um, I'm throwing out metric 
uh, compatibility. And I'm introducing a second metric instead. So I have a second, um, a second covariant derivative. So this is the usual one with the usual metric G. This is the other one with the um, second metric H. And it's compatible with this second metric, but not with the usual metric. And with these two um, covariant derivatives, I can introduce curvature tensors and so on and so forth. Um, okay, so now it's the thing that, that people always stumble over, and I'm, I hope I um, can get this across now. You have one manifold, and you have two metrics on it, and you have two tangential bundles, and you know that they are trivially isomorphic to each other, um, because, well, you know, tangential space is always an n-dimensional vector space, so you can identify them with each other, but you don't a priori know how to do it. So if you have some uh, vector field that belongs to um, the funny stuff with the H metric and you have some other field that belongs to our usual stuff, you don't know um, how to compare them with each other because you have no way to compare um, the basis. Um, so that, that's a problem which is ver very similar to what you have in special relativity. You have two sorts of observers and um, they have their descriptions of their physical effects and you want to get them from the one observer to the other observer. So um, what I introduced for that purpose is what I call a pullover. The pullover does nothing than um, converting everything from the one observer to the other observer, in particular um, the metric, and it does it in such a way that it's compatible with the tensor structure, so it will convert every tensor into a tensor. And then um, the funny metric <coughs> corresponds to a usual two tensor for our observers and the other way around. So um, our metric um, corresponds to a two tensor for um, the observer made of the funny stuff. Um, so I have introduced these functions that have generically 16 degrees of freedom, but I constrain them to be compatible with the covariant derivatives and that drops out some degrees of freedom and leaves others. So, um, the, um, what you can do with this, with these derivatives, is you can introduce now equations of motions for um, some, uh, some other metal fields in a uh, standard way, and you take the variation and you get the equation of motion. So this is really straightforward. Um, however, what you really want to have now is um, this is the last slide. This is where it gets messy. So you have a second metric, uh, but you want to know what this metric looks like. So the paper is called a bimetric theory with exchange symmetry. You now know what is bimetric about it. And the exchange <coughs> symmetry is that you have a second set of Einstein's field equations for the second metric that um, has a similar source term to the one of our metric just with this, with a flipped sign. And here are the pullovers that enter here. You need them so the BIK identities can be fulfilled. So if you count the degrees of freedom, it matches. Okay, so yeah, I have one more sentence to say. Um, for those of you who were disappointed I didn't talk about quantum gravity phenomenology, you can come talk to me later. Mm -hmm.